Um, hello, Tim Wainwright from Ad International. We work with disabled people in Africa and Asia. Um, I had a quick question, actually, which went goes back mostly to what Kevin said uh, at the beginning and also some of the comments made um, by the other speakers. Um, I think um, fascinating range of uh, presentations, and to be honest, I agree with to be pretty much every word that's been spoken. How so dull. my my uh, how dull? No, no, no. My question is more though to think about. Um, the practicalities of this, because um, a lot of what's been presented on income inequality seems to me to be something that has happened as a result of a range of policies that have been pursued over many years. And we're now looking at a new framework for the next you know, couple of decades or something. And I'm interested in what might be the most actionable and measurable policies. And I'm interested particularly in drawing a contrast between uh, whether one focuses on income or on groups. And I'm wondering, for instance, if I look at the field I work in of disability, there are some very clear and very measurable and simple things that could be done. You know, build schools that are always accessible rather mm -hmm. than not all the time, or um, making sure children go to school, disabled children go to school, many don't. And it's very clear to me, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious whether that's happening or not. And so I'm just wondering, as a tactic to address income inequality, whether the most actionable uh, way forward is to focus on particularly excluded groups, including women. And I also wanted to say how important the intersection is, so disabled women would be a high priority for me. So, uh, but a question particularly for Kevin. Hello, Kevin, nice to see you. I think a question for Kevin, and also a question for Richard, in terms um, of thinking through be. the action, the sort of action points that come from this. So, go to... Duncan now. Thanks. Duncan Green from Oxfam. Follows along very well from, from Tim's question. I mean, fantastic descriptions. Uh, descriptions. I'm interested in the prescriptions. You know, what does this mean? How does an agenda arising out of what all you guys have been saying differ from the chronic poverty agenda? Um, one possibility is we go sort of a chronic poverty route, like Tim said, of, of targeting, more targeting, to use an unpopular word. Um, Another one is, uh, you know, uh, Alex said he didn't believe in targeting, that these have to be kind of whole society interventions. So what do those look like beyond tax? Tax is the one we can all agree on. Beyond tax, we're talking about more work on norms. Are we talking about more work on social cohesion? Do we identify those ratchet processes that increase inequality, like financial crises? Um, do we think more about ceilings as well as floors? Go back to East Asia on ceilings on land ownership. You know, what does this actually mean, rather than just saying this is a better description of the world? Um, Charles Knox Vidmanov from Help Age International. Um, again, a lot of parallels actually with the last two questions. Um, but my question was really about social protection within the post 2015, well, within this debate around inequalities in the post 2015 debate. Um, I mean, firstly, obviously, social protection is kind of proven, I think, to have a real significant impact on in inequalities. And there's a lot of data out there from the, the kind of progress that countries have made over the last decade, for example. Um, Often in relation to the Gini countries like Brazil, for example, it'd be actually quite interesting to see those impacts in relation to the, the kind of Palmer Index. Um, but also, I think something that strikes me is that one of those vertical inequalities, the way that countries tend to build social protection systems isn't usually by some kind of poverty-targeted safety net. It's usually on the, along the lines of identifying kind of specific risks and vulnerabilities throughout the life course, old age, disability, family vulnerabilities, childhood, for example, and kind of building a system in that way. So it seems like, you know, and that's a concept that I think uh, is, is being kind of developed into this idea of a social protection flaw. So really, uh, it seems to me that social protection systems flaws seem to kind of cut across this tackling vertical income inequalities, but also addressing the, the horizontal inequalities. But I'm not, I haven't really seen, I mean, uh, there's a recognition of social protection within these inequalities debates, but it doesn't seem to be, I guess, as I see it, getting the recognition it deserves. So it'd be interesting to know from your perspectives, maybe why that might be the case. Okay. And then pass it over to Emma for the, this round. Thank you, Emma Salmon ODI. Uh, just a very quick comment for Alex, actually, that I was very interested in what you said about the Palma as being um, compatible with horizontal <coughs> inequality measures. Um, it struck me that it's also much more compatible than the Gini with looking at uh, multiple dimensions of well-being, that you could easily construct the sort of measure you've constructed for income across other dimensions. And I just wondered if that's something that you've, you've done or, or would intend to do. Thanks. 
Thank you all. Now, if you don't mind, what I'm actually going to do is uh, take a bit of a liberty and ask Richard, um, who we can see on the screen in front of us, Richard Morgan, um, who is the lead policy advisor on post-2015 for UNICEF and also has probably been the key mover behind the the thematic consultation on inequalities, which is one of the consultations that really has been, you know, has the most sort of traction and power behind it. Um, so a lot of those questions really were about how one translates this analysis into substantive proposals to tackle some of these questions, what looks like, you know, what's happening to some of these ideas within that conversation on post-2015, what's in, what's out. So I wonder if you could address some of those questions and tell us anything else you think that we've missed out on in terms of the politics of this and how this is turning into something real and substantive in post-2015. 